Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's a joy to gather as God's people on the first day of the week to sing, to pray, to hear from God's Word, to see the Lord's uh, gospel proclaimed visually through partic participating in the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. And it's a joy for us at a pivotal moment in our worship gathering to open up God's Word and to hear preaching proclamation from God's Word. If you have a copy of the Scriptures, I want to invite you to turn to Luke's Gospel. Today we'll be in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. If you have an app, I invite you to open it up there. I'm going to read it, I'm going to pray, and then we'll dive in. Luke chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. It says, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesareth, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have told all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, and who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Let's pray one more time. Father, we thank you. We adore you. It's overwhelming. Uh, it's, it's breathtaking. This reckless love of God, which has manifested itself in the person of Jesus. It is the spirit of who has brought us to see Jesus. It is the Spirit who has gathered us this morning, and by your grace, we have full access to the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. We have full access to the Word of God, that our souls might be encouraged, that our souls might be nourished and strengthened. And so in this brief 30 minutes, God, I pray, we pray, that you would show us the beauty and the glory of Jesus. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, well, my name is Charles Shannon. Uh, it was mentioned I serve as the lead church planting pastor of the Mission Church, a church plant in Norfolk, Virginia. And I believe these 11 verses that are before us, they talk about calling. They talk about the calling of the first disciples. And Chris, Pastor Chris, he asked me uh, before I dive into the text to, to kind of share my calling to church planning. And so I want to talk about the calling of the first disciples, but briefly, if you would allow me a few minutes to share about my calling to faith, my calling to Virginia, and my calling to church planting in Norfolk, Virginia. Again, my name is Charles. I am a poor, skinny kid from the projects in Pensacola, Florida. Now, if you know Florida is shaped like this, I'm from the panhandle. So I'm deep in the corner, uh, about 30 minutes from the Alabama state line. So think countryness, think southern, uh, think historic racism, think uh, a small country town. Some of you may have spent some time there. I know it's a, it's a big stop uh, for Navy training or uh, you've passed through on a vacation. You love our white sandy beaches. And so uh, you go and you vacation to Northwest Florida, where I grew up there in a non-Christian home, and when I say non-Christian home, uh, my family, we didn't go to church on Christmas or Easter, all right? <laughs> so we were non-Christian as can be. 
Uh, in my teenage years, actually at the age of 16, I went to church for the first time to a missionary Baptist church. And I won't say that that church didn't proclaim the gospel, but maybe I was just too dark and dead to, to hear the gospel proclamation of that church at that age. Well, I began to get involved in the street life. I was the neighbor, a neighborhood drug dealer. Um, I was on my way to hell. I was on my way to Florida State Prison. I was on my way to Escambia County Jail because that's where all of my friends, my mentors, and those whom I looked up to, that's where they were going. Uh, by God's grace, um, after I dropped out of high school and became a full-time uh, neighborhood street entrepreneur, uh, God sent a gift to me. He sent a young lady who had just joined the Navy, and if you're enlisted, uh, as many of you know, you go to boot, land, boot camp, you hit Great Lakes, and then you go to your A school, and her A school was in my hometown. Well, I met her, and immediately I was aware that there was something different about this girl. She spoke differently, she carried herself differently, but the biggest distinguishing marker about her is she was a Christian. Well, I wasn't. And I'm not a proponent of missionary dating, but this girl became my best friend, and she gently and carefully shared Christ. And one day in the summer of 2006, I believed on Jesus. Uh, the Spirit of God came over me and showed me that my life was uh, not the fullest. My life was broken. It was shattered and uh, that I needed help. I knew that. I sensed that. But I, I found the answer to my brokenness, to uh, my, my sinfulness, uh, to my desire to be forgiven and to be whole. I found that in Jesus through her witness. Well, uh, by God's grace, I married this girl. And um, I, I thought God had called me into law enforcement. And so I pursued a career in law enforcement, even got picked up um, at the local police department as a cadet. Don't ask me how I passed the polygraph, but by God's grace... I was there for two years, and I just thought that that was my vocational calling until this girl that I had just married that led me to Christ, she said, she came to me and said, hey, I have orders to Norfolk, Virginia. And I'm like, wait, hold up. I'm supposed to become like a lay pastor in the Baptocostal church we're attending uh, in Pensacola, and I'm supposed to be working in law enforcement for 30 years. This isn't in the equation. But nevertheless, God had different plans. And so we got here, and I immediately began to attend a local Christian university in Virginia Beach. And I'm studying the Bible there. And I'm studying theology there. And I get exposed to Grudem, you know, the thick one. And you know what happens when you start studying Grudem. Uh, you get love and affections for uh, what we call Reformed theology. And the Lord was just blowing my heart up. I'm listening to the podcast. And then at that point, it seemed to me that it was clear God was calling me into vocational ministry. While I thought that would be in the chaplaincy as a military chaplain, um, it turns out while I was in seminary, um, and what's interesting is as Pastor Chris was leaving the seminary, I was coming, and I entered with the express goal to become an active duty chaplain. But God had different plans, and he began to poke at my heart and show me a need for rich, healthy, biblically, theologically rich, gospel-centered churches in urban settings, hence our call to Norfolk. And so by God's grace, uh, my wife reminded me of this yesterday evening. The last time that I was at Anchor Church, it was a Sunday evening worship gathering. Some of y'all are here and y'all remember those days, those glorious Sunday evening days. And she brought this to remembrance last night. She said, we left the worship gathering on Sunday evening and we drove to Norfolk to kind of scope out the neighborhood in the house that we were planning to buy, which we bought so that we could begin to establish ourselves, establish our family, and invite people to be in a healthy gospel church in the city. So that's my calling to faith, that's my calling to Virginia, and that's my calling to church planning. Uh, me and Pastor Chris share some of the same values and some of the same distinctives and uh, things that warm our heart about seeing gospel churches sprout up, and so he asked me to come today. And what I wanna share about today is the gospel calling for us to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says this, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Now, I love Luke's introduction here in this narrative. Now, some of you may be aware, some of you may not be aware, but before Luke chapter 5, and this is profound, there are four chapters, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 2, 
Luke chapter 3 and Luke chapter 4. And in Luke chapter 1, Luke tells us why he is writing and who he is writing to. He's writing to Theophilus. And he says, hey, a lot of folks have said a lot of things about Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of uh, material written and spoken going around about Jesus. And I saw fit to compile all of that information. And we also know that Luke was discipled by the Apostle Paul, right? Paul calls him in Colossians 4.4, 4, the beloved physician. So uh, we know that Luke was a medical doc, but he wasn't just a medical doc by vocation. And uh, he was a, a gospel man. He was an evangelist. And he wanted people to know Jesus, he wanted people to love Jesus, and he wanted people to accurately see Jesus. And so he writes this gospel account. He writes it to Theophilus, and we know Theophilus is going to receive this letter, and Theophilus is going to share it with those in his immediate sphere of influence, if you will. Theophilus is going to share this with those who are in his local church, and they're going to enjoy an accurate, faithful account of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in chapter 1, as Luke begins to write, he tells us about how an angelic being came to a man named Zechariah. Zechariah is in the temple and he's carrying out his priestly duties and this angelic being comes to him and says, Zechariah, I know you are old in age and your wife Elizabeth is old in age, but you're going to have a son and his name will be John. Well, we know as the story progresses, an angelic being comes to a young virgin girl named Mary who is betrothed or engaged to a man named Joseph, and the angel announces to her uh, that you are with child, and his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Another uh, gospel account says his name will be Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. Well, we know Mary is a little perplexed, but she realizes that this is a part of God's plan for her and the entire world. Well, the boy John is born, and shortly thereafter, the boy Jesus is born, and then uh, they both grow up, and they become men. And John begins his ministry, and Jesus begins his ministry at the baptism of John, as John is ushering in something new that is centered upon Jesus. And then in Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes into the temple. He opens up the scroll from Isaiah, and he proclaims that the scriptures all point to him. And this is where we find ourselves now in Luke chapter 5. The crowd is pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God as he is standing by the lake of Gennesareth. Luke details an occasion where Jesus is among the crowd. There's a large multitude of people all enthralled with Jesus. And the text says that they were pressing in on him. And some of you may be asking, Charles, why were they pressing in on him? <laughs> well, pressing in is actually a beautiful metaphor of how many of us came to this worship gathering today. We come as worshipers today pressing in. We come pressing through the cares of the world. We come pressing through the sins of last week, cleansed by the grace of God. We come pressing through our old hurts. We come pressing bruised from old beatings. We come pressing wounded from past transgressions. And we come pressing, weary from physical ailments and bodily sickness, whether they're in us or in those whom we love. We come today pressing. But with the help of God and the presence of a church, we pressed in. I'm sure there are folks today who are like, I'm just not going to come to the worship gathering. I'm just not going to go to the worship gathering today. I'm tired. I feel a little bit down. But by the grace of God, because the Spirit of God moved you in the direction, here we are today. Men and women under the Lordship of Jesus, gathered by the Holy Spirit to hear the glorious news about King Jesus. We come pressing. Why do we come pressing? Because God has called us here. God has called you here. And so I encourage us all to press into community centered upon King Jesus, 
I encourage us all to press into these community groups that are, are meeting throughout the week. I encourage us all to be committed to press into the worship gathering Sunday after Sunday after Sunday for the good of our souls, but also for the glory of Christ. Because as I look around this worship space and I see men and women who love Jesus, who have, heart, have their hearts changed by the gospel, it's a beautiful picture of the body of Christ and Jesus Christ is the head. And speaking of the body of Christ, I am sure as the crowds press in on Jesus that he could feel the people pressing against his body. We press into the church, we press in this morning for the very same reason that the crowds were pressing in on Jesus. Why is that? To hear the word of God. The context tells us that he was standing by the lake of Gennesareth, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. Now, I want us to be mindful. I want us to be uh, aware of the broader context, right? For the last time that Luke showed us Jesus near waters, it was in Luke chapter 3. And what was happening in Luke chapter 3? Well, John the Baptist is in the Jordan River, and he is performing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist River Jordan performing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And the narrative tells us that people were coming to John in droves. And you ask, why were they coming in droves? It's because people knew and know that they are sinful and that they need to repent and that they need the forgiveness of sin. And John is announcing that the time is here. The time is now. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And the scene gets real interesting Because the religious leaders of the day, they begin to come to John. And John, you know what he calls them? He calls them snakes. He says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath that is coming? But then there were some other religious leaders, some scoffers, some mockers, some haters on the sideline, if you will. And they made an appeal to their religious heritage. They're like, John, we don't need your baptism. We got Abraham as our father. And then John announces to them, that God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. It is not in our religious heritage. It is not in our religious do-gooding. It is not in our religious resume. It's by the grace of God where he takes our stony hearts and makes them soft. And now our hearts love Jesus. Now our hearts are repentant toward Jesus. And now our hearts put our faith in Jesus. And then the scene in the Jordan River, it gets all the more interesting when Jesus steps into the water. And John is like, hold up, Jesus. I don't need to baptize you. you. I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus is like, relax, John, chill out. This is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. And so what does John the Baptist do? John the baptizer in the Jordan River. He takes Jesus and he immerses him in the Jordan River. And then Jesus comes out of the water, soaking wet. And then, brothers and sisters, we hear this glorious voice from heaven. It's the voice of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then we see the dove of God, the Holy Spirit, descended like a dove. And what do we see at the Jordan River? We see Trinitarian beauty. Behold our God and worship him, for he is worthy of our adoration. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our devotion. He is Father. He is Son. He is Holy Spirit. Oh, I wish this was a Pentecostal church because we could pause right now and run around this room and give glory to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What's my point? These are similar waters. The lake of Gennesareth actually flows. So so the Jordan River flows from Mount Hermon south through the Sea of Galilee. Now, I love John's baptism, but I also want to make a quick point that it's distinctive from the baptism that we practice as a gospel church. You see, John's baptism points forward to the cross. The wrath of God is coming. Repent and be baptized, right? Right? Uh, but uh, uh, Christian baptism looks back at the cross, right? So, so John's baptism, flee the wrath of God that is to come. And brothers and sisters, the wrath of God, it came. And it was poured out on Jesus for us. Jesus takes the wrath of God. We get grace, forgiveness, and pardon. Jesus is treated like he lived our life, and we're treated like we lived Jesus' life. Perfect. 
stainless, spotless, no blemishes. That is us by the grace of God. And now Christian baptism, if you haven't been baptized yet, I'm sure this church would love to baptize you in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because you look at the cross and say, oh, but the grace of God. And then you say, I want to identify with Jesus. Paul says it better uh, than I could say it. We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be raised to life as he was. If we have been united with him in a death like his, brothers and sisters, most certainly we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. That is the Christian hope. All of our bodies are dying and wasting away, and all of us will at some point or another die. But our hope is resurrection. But our hope is resurrection. But our hope is resurrection. And brothers and sisters, hope doesn't put us to shame. And dear brothers and sisters, we don't have to. That's the gospel, right? Uh, Christ, his death, his resurrection, and that's our hope uh, that we'll die, but, but there's a resurrection, and hope doesn't put us to shame. Matter of fact, uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So if Paul's not ashamed of the gospel, and it is the power of God for salvation then brothers and sisters, we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation. And if the gospel, if the God of the gospel has saved us, dear friends, he can save those who are far away from him, those who are far off. That was all of us. Uh, let, me, let me bring it, bring it, bring it down to the ground. If we can be saved, then the worst of sinners can be saved. Well, how are they saved? By the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel, be it our classwork, classmates, co-workers, be it our next door neighbor. I know you know your neighbor just isn't going to come to Jesus. I know he or she is just wacky, right, and and would never come to Jesus. But how about we uh, uh, trust and believe that it is the power of God to save? And I pray when the church gathers, it be gospel centrality but not just when the church is gathered, when the church is scattered in community. I pray we don't just assume that people know the gospel, that they love the gospel, that they understand the contours and the layers of the gospel, but we be gospel-centered in our community away from the gathering. And I pray we believe that this year, in 2018, God is going to use us opening up our mouths and sharing the gospel to draw a man or woman to himself. Right? Do we all believe that? Like, like this year, like we can open up our mouth, we can share the gospel, and someone would believe on Jesus for the forgiveness of sin and a new life in him. Um, I pray that everybody believes that. I pray. Nevertheless, Jesus is teaching by the lake of Gennesareth. And the crowd is pressing in to hear the word of God. God is the source uh, of Jesus' ministry. And God is the source of Jesus' word. These are words that are sourced in God. And Jesus is is teaching them. And then look at verse 2 with me. Read along. It says this. He, this is Jesus, he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and they were washing their nets. We're not told about the bodily smell of the fishermen. We're not told about the aroma of the sea, but Luke actually sets the scene for us. There are two boats. There's a lake. There's fishermen. The fishermen are out of the boats, and now they're washing up their nets as if they're finished. And verse 3 pictures Jesus getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's. We all know Simon Peter. He asked him to put out a little from the land, and he, this is Jesus, he sat down, and what did Jesus do? He taught the people. He taught the people from the boat. He taught the the, the crowd. He taught the gathering, if you will. Well, what did Jesus teach? I think that's a phenomenal question to ask of the passage. Uh, The text, it doesn't explicitly tell us the content of Jesus' teaching. But maybe, maybe he taught them that it was necessary that the Messiah come and suffer and then enter into glory. Luke 24. 
Maybe he taught them what it says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. That's a, a, a prophecy about John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple. And we saw in Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes into the temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And maybe Jesus said, he, he quoted Malachi 3, 1, and he was like, the time is now. Uh, maybe he taught them that it was necessary that he be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, maybe he taught them what it says uh, in Luke chapter 4 when he entered in the temple and he opened up the scroll from Isaiah. Maybe he taught them that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Maybe Jesus taught them that there was good news in lack. Maybe Jesus taught them that there was good news in shortage. Maybe he taught them that it, there was good news on a fish day where we didn't catch any fish. Maybe Jesus taught them, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, uh, blessed are, are those who are persecuted uh, for my sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Maybe Jesus taught them what he told Satan in, 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 uh, after, so John baptizes him and then he's cast into the wilderness. The, the text actually says the spirit cast him into the wilderness. We don't like that verse because the devil, devil didn't cast him into the wilderness. It was the spirit of God who cast him into the wilderness. But then as the devil begins to tempt him, he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Maybe he taught them what that means, or, or maybe he taught them uh, what he told Satan after his second temptation, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve, or maybe he taught them uh, what he told Satan after the third temptation, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Nevertheless, the passage doesn't tell us what Jesus taught. But we know that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, and we know that Jesus was full of the Word of God as he taught them by the lake of Gennesaret. And verse 4 says, this spirit-endowed teaching by Jesus, the poor Nazarene, it's, it says uh, he taught them for uh, a period. And then verse 4 says this, and when he had finished speaking, Jesus, he turns toward Peter and he said to Simon, put out. That's a command. That's the imperative move. Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, what does the text say? Master. Let me pause, because with reference to Jesus, I pray that every man, every woman, every child, with reference to Jesus, that your first response would be, Master. I pray that Jesus would be your master. Jesus calls you. He wants to be your master. He's a good master. He's not a brutal slave owner. He's a good master. Give yourself to him completely and wholly. Give yourself to Jesus. He calls you to follow him. That's how Simon answers. Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, plain translation. We've labored through the whole night. The result, nothing. We didn't catch nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. We may not have been as successful as we would have hoped. Uh, we didn't catch as many fish as we set out. Things didn't go exactly like we would have planned or hoped or even how we prayed. But nevertheless, at your word, Lord, I will obey. Just like Mary, she says, be it unto me, Lord. I don't get it. I've not known a man in that way. Right? I'm preparing to marry Joseph. This is a sticky situation. I'm all pregnant and stuff, right? <laughs> but Mary is like, at your word. And Simon models that for us as well. I get hyped reading how the net translates uh, Luke 5, verse 6. It translates it this way. And when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their net started to tail, went tear. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their net started to tear. There was a multitude of fish. I mean, so many fish that the nets are tearing and they're, they're breaking. What a miracle, right? 
And I think our temptation is to see the miracle and to be enthralled with the miracle. Wow, that was miraculous. But brothers and sisters, let us pause. Let us be enthralled with the miracle while understanding that the miracle is intended to point us to the master. The miracle in and of itself is great, but the miracle, the purpose of the miracle is to point us to the master. And I tell uh, the folks at Mission Church this all the time. I find it a miracle that our church even exists, a biblically rich, gospel-centered, missional uh, church in Norfolk, Virginia, in the urban center of Norfolk, Virginia. Listen, I tell this to my people all the time. I think it's a miracle that I'm a Christian, right? I should be in Florida State Prison right now, getting out of prison, doing the same things that got me locked up and going back. That's where all my homeboys and my, and my friends from back in the day, that's what they're doing. But by the great, I, it's a miracle that God called me uh, to be a minister of the gospel. And brothers and sisters, if we're honest, it's a miracle that any of us are saved. Let us not hold that lightly, that the Spirit of God made us anew caused us to be born again to a new and living hope. And listen, I, I heard the mention, uh, uh, you start at 10 o'clock, but sometimes y'all start at 10.02, and sometimes y'all start at 10.03. And, and praise God, y'all will clean that up in the new year. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, even if we start at 10.01, 10.02, 10.03, or, or right on time, it's a miracle that Anchor Church exists. It's a miracle that there are people who could sleep in, but you're here early and you're pressing in to hear the word of God. Uh, the church on mission in the city is a miracle like this catch of fish. It's a miracle. It's a sign. It's a wonder, if you will. And sign is exactly what these fishermen begin to do in verse 7. Listen to what the text says. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They signaled to their partners in the other boat. Let me help you all out. That's what the mission church is, is, is doing uh, to you. We're like, hey, God's called us to plant a gospel church, and that's hard. And so we're signaling to anchor church saying, help, come help, come help. We need help. There's a large catch of fish. Would you help us? And what did Pastor Chris say? Charles, we got you. We're with you. We want to see the gospel advance. Uh, here in Virginia Beach and the surrounding cities, we, Charles, we want to see the gospel advance in, in Norfolk, and so we're with you. Uh, we're getting some firmness. We're being established, coming out of the, the planting life and being established, and we want to help and see other gospel churches planted. And so I'm thankful. Let me, let me say that loud and clear. I'm thankful for your partnership that I can signal and say, hey, God's called us to a hard work in a hard city, in a transient city, in an urban city, and we have the hope of the gospel, but thank you that I can signal, and by God's grace, what does the text say? They could have been like, no, nah, that's your catch, y'all got it. It says, and they came. And what are the results? They filled both the boats, whoo, so that they begin to sink, immersed in the grace of God. Whoo, I love it, miraculous catch. And so by God's grace, God invites us into this type of miraculous work. Uh, we need help. We need assistance in making known the miracle, the sign, the wonder. Look at verses 8 through 10 as we uh, come to a close. It says this. But when Simon Peter saw it, this miracle, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Kind of like Isaiah, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips in the presence of a holy God. Like the demon uh, said to Jesus in Luke chapter 4 in the temple, I know who you are, Jesus, the holy one of God. Uh, they were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners or, or partakers, if you will, with Simon. That's mission. That's the mission to make disciples, participating and partaking and fellowshipping and co-laboring for the sake of what Jesus calls being fishers of men. And Jesus comforts them. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. You will become fishers of men, some translations say. So Jesus is calling his first disciples. He calls them by name. 
His call to discipleship is to follow him, to become fishers of men. And, and some of us may be wondering, how will this see a fish be produced? How will this small church plant in Norfolk become a, a, a worshiping and witnessing community in the city? Because as we look at the city, we see there's many men and women who we pray that the Holy Spirit would catch. Like he caught me in that fateful morning in August of 2006 where I flushed all that foolishness down the toilet and followed his call to discipleship. Uh, we believe that uh, as we look at the city, we've got the world's largest Navy base. And so, so God wants to uh, see military men and women and families caught by his spirit and gathered in a worshiping and witnessing community in the city of Norfolk. Uh, we've got Old Dominion University, over 25,000 students, internationals coming. So God has brought the nations to Norfolk. We don't have to necessarily go on a, a short-term missions trip to reach the nations because they're there studying at ODU. We've got Norfolk State University, very near and dear to my heart, a beautiful historical black college. I love walking on that campus. I see beautiful black folk created in the image and likeness of God, and it's glorious. But God wants to catch them uh, by his spirit. Uh, we, see, we know there's students from EVMS, uh, future med docs, who are in our city, and uh, by God's grace, we want to see them in a worshiping and witnessing community. We know that the urban dynamics are present from the hipsters, the gentrifiers, the urban renewalists, uh, hip-hop culture, dope boys, OGs. We want to see all of the beautiful tapestry of diversity, uh, right? So this is what I say. We don't need a military church to reach the military. We don't need a collegiate church to reach college students. We don't need an urban church to reach the urban folk. We don't need a hip-hop church to reach the hip-hop culture. We need a gospel church, and we want to invite the diversity of the city who live, learn, work, and play in the city of Norfolk to be together in this disciple-making, worshiping, and witnessing community for the good of the city, but ultimately for the glory of God. And I count you as partners in this work. God has not called us to the Triple C Club, the convenient, comfortable Christian club. That's not the invitation today. But if you look at verse 11, where I conclude, this call to discipleship is costly. It's going to cost us something. It'll be costly. They left everything to follow him. They left everything to follow him. So maybe God calls us to clear out our living rooms so that we can be more hospitable and help others follow him as we follow them. Uh, maybe God is calling some of us to clear out our schedules so we can help in the process or, or be participants in the process of making disciples and catching fish. Uh, maybe God is calling some of us to reassess our spending habits so that we can be contributors to the mission to make disciples. Maybe God is calling us to reassess our fears, our phobias, our preferences, our prejudice, our vices, uh, to reassess our giftings, our talents, our abilities, our tolerance for suffering, suffering, because Luke 24, Jesus' ministry is suffering in glory. And when we see the gospel take root, it's glorious, but dear friends, there's also suffering in this call to discipleship. Don't be confused if you're in a season of suffering and think you're, you're out of uh, the grace of God, for even in seasons of suffering, God is advancing his purposes and plans in you and in his church. This miraculous catch, it was meant to point them to Jesus. And this miraculous passage, it's in goal to point us to Christ, who is the head of the church. So if you see him today, follow him. Some of you have a sense for the first time that you should follow him. Faith in him. Trust in him. As you sit in that seat, you're faithing, you're trusting that that seat will uphold you. Well, trust in him. His finished work on the cross, his glorious resurrection, faith in him. And some of you are thinking, man, I, I was baptized and I thought it was, like, it was more like John's baptism than, a res it was, uh, than less of a response to the cross. And I'm responding to the cross, yet I haven't been baptized. I'm sure, talk with some of the leaders here, they love to baptize you. And then last but not least, some of you are considering uh, following me as I follow Christ in Norfolk. We'll have you. Me and Pastor Chris, we'll get a big bucket of oil. We'll anoint you and send you to Norfolk <laughs> to help us with the mission church. Hey, I'm grateful for your partnership. I'm grateful that we can enjoy the gospel and the word of God together. Can we pray and then respond uh, in the, the way that a disciple responds? With baptism, yes, but also in partake, partaking in the broken body and shed blood of Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.